um, she was seemed to be fine. Uh, she was born at home, and uh, with my grandmother taking care of the the birth, and um, everything was fine. And then the second day, something happened, and and she turned blue, and they lost her. Mom was originally from Maine, um, uh, Little Field Sconner out in Auburn. Dad originally came following his father, who came to work in as a lumberjack because it was too hard in Canada on the farms. Um, and um, so then once he got established, he would call the, the children down, the boys especially. And uh, Dad was the youngest, so he came last. And he worked a little bit in the woods, but then uh, everything started going in the mills, and somebody said there was a place. So he came and he got the job that day because they really badly needed mill workers. It was at a time of uh, the, the growth. Um, see, I was born in 1945, so that dad had been here, I think, quite a few years. And um, so uh, when they came down, they would just come to the shops and, and the mills and ask for work. And most of the time they got it. Right on the spot. Right on, on the spot. Hide on the spot. And that's why they started coming down in droves. I know for a while it was kind of like an everyday occurrence that what they would do is they would come down on the train and uh, right on Lincoln Street here at the depot and they'd go across the street to FX Marcotte and uh, go see, they had all been told, go see Monsieur Marcotte and he'll take care of you. So he'd, they'd go see Monsieur Marcotte, they'd order all the furniture they needed for their apartment and uh, they would pay 25 cents a week and Monsieur Marcotte said they never lost a penny because they they always he knew if they were French Canadian that they were going to get paid and um so that's how they would get established when mom and dad met they lived on Birch Street then i discovered talking to a lot of mill workers that what would happen is if as the wages went up a little bit they went about 3 4 blocks up and that's how we got from Birch to Bartlett because that was a supposedly a better neighborhood and then when we left Bartlett Street, because Dad had gotten better wages and stuff, they bought a house on Warren Avenue, which was fields, you know, and, and nothing there. Um, now it's, it's kind of a huge, hugely built up. And um, so they bought a, a little house for $8,000, and they had uh, three children at the time. I thought Little Canada included Lincoln Street, uh, River, Oxford, and, and Lincoln Street. And when I found out, when I was asked to do a documentary for somebody, um, we found out there was very, very little written. And so I got four ladies who were born and raised there, and, and three of them still live there, and um, found out that it, it's actually not Lincoln Street because uh, one lady living, oh no, je pas petit Canada, moi, you know, and very vehemently, I was, it took me back because it, if you were a little Canada, that's because you were in the tenements. So when, we did, when we did the documentary, it was interesting because I was coming down the one-way street on Oxford Street, and I saw the lady was sitting on the stoop, and it reminded me because I have relatives that lived on Lincoln Street, so we played in Little Canada when I was little. And uh, so when I was coming down the street, uh, she recognized me, and I saw her get up, and I said, she turned around, she went, hey, Louise! And I thought it was so funny, it brought so many memories, because that's how they used to communicate. Louise lives on the third floor, and they used to, I remember, they used to talk to each other from window to window over the street. You know, I thought, tu sick? J'ai besoin, je peux pas faire une tarte, you know, and, you know, so they brought the sugar over and stuff. And so it was really interesting, uh, you know, and we asked her if we could go into the tenement to see where her apartment was. And uh, she brought us up. And one of the things that she commented on, she says, you would never see this before because there was uh, sand on the floors and stuff. Because if you went into a French Canadian home, you could eat off the floor because that's how clean they kept their place. And when I walked in, I looked at that. I went, oh my goodness, the dining room was huge. I says, my goodness, this is a dance hall. And she said, well, you got to remember, we were big families. She says, we were 12 kids. So we had to have a big dining area. But then when you went to the little rooms around, it, it was a bed with two, three kids in each bed. 
you know, and so it was very interesting to go back to that that time. We we always used to laugh at him when he'd come home because um, he had lint in his eyes, ears, nose, and belly button, and we said, Dad, what kind of work do you do anyways? You know, we couldn't understand that. I had an opportunity in 1978 to come and visit him, and I I left here crying because it was amazing. Uh, as soon as it was July, and when I walked in, it was 120 degrees. I could have just wrung my clothes out. It was so I was so wet. And when I got to him, finally, I mean, there was lint going all over the place. And I says, well, no wonder he had it in his belly button. I mean, look at this. And then when I wanted to talk to him, there were so many looms going. We had to get nose to nose to be able and screaming at each other in order to be able to um, understand and hear each other. And I said, no wonder he's totally deaf because, I mean, there's no way that you can go through this and, and not lose your hearing and so forth. You know, when we did the reunion of mill workers, I was amazed by two things. First of all, when they walked off the elevator, I had been here now to see my father. When they walked off the elevator, they would go, oh, I'm home. And I said, they're home. You got to be kidding me. And I had a program with all these dignitaries and stuff that I cut in half because when I saw them running to each other and it was like, you know, seeing family again, you know, they were so happy to be together. So you got to remember they spent six, seven days together here all day long. So it, they became a fam They had a family here as workers and then they went home to their, their real family. When dad first started, I remember that he used to work you know, much longer hours. He'd come home till, you know, later in the evening. Then the unions came in and things started, you know, uh, doing better. And uh, so at four o'clock, he'd come home, his shift would finish at three and he'd be home on the bus by four o'clock. And uh, so uh, we had a more time to enjoy him and he was home to have dinner with us and things. So but as prior. we grew up, but prior, we didn't see him as much. They were longer hours. It depended on some of the, some of the, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the orders that they had and what they, the type of bedspread that they were doing and so forth. So um, sometimes he'd say, you know, so if we had plans on Saturday to do things, because Saturdays were a family day on Lisbon Street. So everybody went down to Lisbon Street because that's where you went to do your shopping and you enjoyed stopping at the soda fountain and you got to meet your friends and, and everything. So um, Lisbon Street was very important to the workers. Uh, the norm usually was that on Sunday you, you went to mass with your family and then after that you packed up everything and you went to either the grandma's house or uh, you went to, to do something with Mame and Pepe or Ma Tante Manonque or, you know, we'd take turns and, and of course music was very important to them. So everybody brought their instruments. So we'd start by, you know, playing games and then we'd sit down and, and uh, very often we'd listen to Madame Bolduc, um, a, a lady, famous uh, a songster from um, uh, Nova Scotia and uh, and uh, we'd sing with her, and then we'd start taking out the instruments, and we'd do our own song and dancing. I always wondered, you know, uh, doing all the research here, why in the world did we get to be so depressed here in Lewiston-Arbin? I mean, what is it, you know, that, I mean, yeah, we lost jobs and stuff, but it was more than that, because in speaking to the, the people, for example, um, the work doing just this piece here. The girl came in and uh, I asked her what, what sh her job was. She says, well, I was, a doff I was just a doffer. But then when we started talking about what doffing meant and, and uh, you know, how many people it took before she got the job, you know, eight people didn't get the job because they weren't fast enough and couldn't do it. Um, I, I discovered that they talk about themselves as individuals by their work. I was a weaver, I was a doffer, I was a loom fixer. Then all of a sudden, overnight, there's no more work, they're, no, they're nobody anymore. And then I thought, well, that's what happened to the community. Because the mills, the shoe shops, brick making was the economic engine. And almost overnight, in history's sake, speaking, 
um, we were all closed up and depressed and whatnot, and the community itself didn't know anymore who it was. So it followed the individual to the community, and it were just now as a community and as individuals. I find that when we bring local people in and we talk to them about how great we were as a, as a people and the spirit we had for our ancestors, they leave here with a new pride. And um, we're finding when groups come in, they leave here with the new pride of the community. Tourists come in, and when they leave here, they, they are amazed at the type of community that we are and the spirit that we have. Lawrence and Lowell, uh, Pawtucket, Massachusetts, uh, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, and here, of course, we had Biddeford, we had Augusta, um, and Lewiston Aubin because the reason that Benjamin Bates came up from Boston as being a, a big developer was because of the falls here and be, the water power and so forth. So um, when you look at, the, you know, for a while the, the community was talking about filling in the, the canal system and we went, oh, you know, this is such a beautiful part of our community and a, a historical part of our community that it didn't take too long that we kind of tried to put that to bed because, uh, you know, uh, you go out to different places and they're building uh, canal systems in order to enhance the beauty of their community. We've got the original beauty here. And if you take a kayak ride down the river and go into the, the lower canal and the cross canals, it is amazing to be able to look at the work that they did. I don't, you don't understand how they could have done those big granite walls with not the equipment of today. I mean, it's like, how did they do it, you know? But it's a, it's, it's a work of art, and it's amazing to see. It started with the lumber industry, and, uh, but when they started building the canal system, then they, they, uh, they took over the, the water power. The, uh, we have a major partnership with Bates College, and uh, every year four or five of their classes come in and ask if they can do something, you know, as part of their class projects. And, and we try very hard to make, you know, have look up projects that will really mean something that we can utilize and keep in the archives forever because um, we, don't, we want the students to really get a feel for who we are. And actually, we've helped four students now change what they were planning to do in life because of their work here. And uh, they found it so interesting. And, and uh, so, you know, it's a it's a win win for both of us, because a lot of the work they do, we wouldn't be able to do because we don't have the staff and so forth. And they learn a lot in different ways, whether it's doing work for us on the river or doing work on oral histories, um, you know, and, and it's really funny. Uh, we're all about connecting generations at the museum. And the first class that we held to teach the, the students about uh, helping us to do oral histories from some of the French Canadians, they were, the, the faces were so scared. We went, what's the matter? You know, and they said, we have to talk to old people. And I kind of was taken aback because, you know, we're multi-generational and all that, you know, but then when you stop and think, a lot of these young people don't live near their grandparents or whatever, you know, the families are scattered today and whatnot, and, and so they were literally scared to have to go talk to old people. When I call the old people to tell them that we would like to, would they be willing to be interviewed by college students, oh, uh, I know education, I, my, my English not good, and they were scared to talk to the young students. And so we, we got them together, and we had a little class reunion after, and we asked them to invite their interviewees, and when they, when they started coming in, it was like the students would run to their elder and, and hug and, and, you know, bring, and we're so proud to introduce them, so we said, Look at that, you know, we're connecting generations, you know, it was beautiful to see, so...